Hi, and welcome to the Origins Podcast. I'm your host, Lawrence Krauss. Earlier in the fall of last year, the Origins Project Foundation ran two public events in California, in Orange County and subsequently in San Diego at the beautiful Air and Space Museum there. We've already aired the event at Orange County, which was a lecture by me. We have aired it as a special guest event uh, on January 1st. And now I'm very happy to air the second event, which was a dialogue with the physicist, the astrophysicist and podcaster, Brian Keating. Now, Brian's been a guest on my podcast and I've been a guest on his, and we decided to do a public event in his home stomping ground and uh, then co-posted on both of our podcasts, which we're doing now. And uh, we followed up on our earlier discussions and it was a fun and fascinating discussion as it always is with Brian. We discussed areas of astrophysics and cosmology, science more generally, the difference between being a theorist and an experimentalist, our different perspectives, and also perspectives on science education more generally. And then that was followed up with a really interesting question and answer period from the audience. All of that's included in this podcast, which I hope you'll enjoy. You can watch it commercial free as always on the Substack site, Critical Mass, and proceeds from that uh, go to help support the Nonprofit Origins Project Foundation that produces this podcast. And of course, you can also see it on our YouTube channel, the Origins Podcast YouTube channel. I hope you'll consider subscribing to that as well. Now, no matter however you watch it or listen to it, and of course, you can listen to it on any podcast site. I hope you enjoy it. It was a lot of fun. And I hope you also consider uh, supporting the podcast at, through the Origins Project Foundation, which produces the public events, the podcast, and also other travel experiences. So happy 2024 with our essentially our first official podcast of the year. And I think I'm looking forward to many more interesting discussions uh, over the course of the coming months. Take care and enjoy this, I hope. It's great to be here. I, I, I'm, I'm really thankful for the museum and for Brian. When, when the Origins Project decided to do some events in California, uh, when the last one we did was in Orange County a, a few days ago, and I contacted Brian. I thought it'd be great to come down here. And Brian, um, because he's on the board, said, you know, I have a great place, and he arranged for this to happen. And 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 so it's it's the first time I've been here, but it is truly an amazing place. And what a what a place to have this this joint podcast in a sense that we're doing. The Origins Project is is uh, does do public events every now and then, and this is just a a wonderful venue. So I want to thank you and the museum. It's been it's been great, and of course. Andy Ornan, who who organized it and helped set up the venue and 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 the 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 VIP reception, it's been a gr it's been a great chance to meet many of you. So it's fun to be with Brian here, and and I hope we'll disagree and chat uh, about science. And since it's his home turf, I'm going to turn it back to him for the moment. Yeah, one of the things I'm most uh, excited to talk to you about tonight uh, in our signature kind of way, where we debate things. I am a what I call a practicing agnostic Jew, which we can get into what actually that means. Lawrence is a devout Bible-beating Christian, as you all know. Can't get enough of it. Uh, we'll talk about religion. We'll talk about politics, all the stuff you're not supposed to. But really, to talk science with uh, a person who has had an, uh, a, a considerable influence, both on my career and my thought process, but on a generation of, of young, young people. And I want to start with something that, you know, you can deny paternity, maybe, but um, I want you to talk about this mysterious substance, which I'm told fills the universe uh, almost without par, and it's called dark energy. And it's something that you and our friend, mutual friend Mike Turner, uh, really invented, discovered. But let's talk about the scientific process. How do you think of this creation and the fact that it will someday rip all of our molecules apart? How do you... By the way, I appreciate what you say. I, I, with the news that you said I cast a long shadow on science because I thought that was an interesting way of putting it. But um, uh, so dark energy is the biggest mystery in, I think, in fundamental physics. It is the fact that when you take space and get rid of all the particles and all the radiation and everything and just have empty space there, it weighs something. And, and we don't know why. It is true that Mike and I had, had proposed 
um, that it existed. Mostly, I did anyway, and I think I convinced Mike that I, I was being heretical uh, because at the time that we looked at the data and all the data of cosmology didn't agree with the our picture of cosmology, the standard model of cosmology. We knew, we theorists knew way before the observers, and he's an observer and I'm a, an experiment, he's an experimentalist, I'm a theorist. We'll get into the difference, and there are differences. Um, and But we theorists were virtually certain that the universe was flat. That that means it's, the, and I and the other day in Orange County, I don't think I got to explain what flat was, so I should explain here, it's not flat like a pancake. It's flat, a flat universe is just one in which the X, Y, and Z axes point in the same direction throughout all of space. If you follow them up, they keep going in straight lines. A curved universe is one that you might imagine the X, Y, and Z axis point here, it, up there, but somewhere in the distant part of the universe is over here, over there, and over there. And in a, in a in say in a closed universe, if you look far enough in that direction, you'll see the back of your head. There are good theoretical reasons, and maybe we'll get to them, why we thought the universe was flat, but, but there was a big problem. The observers, being difficult people, um, did not, wasn't, weren't finding the universe to be flat. They're, well, they weren't finding enough matter to make the universe flat because the geometry of the universe depends upon the stuff in it. And you have to have a certain amount of stuff to make a flat universe. And it wasn't the right amount of stuff within a factor of three. And then we looked at all sorts of other observations and it wasn't just, just not agreeing. And then we realized it, in order to make it all agree, you'd have to fill up the universe with another kind of energy the energy of nothing. And that was so absurd and ridiculous. That's why I love the idea of proposing it. But more important, I did it because, and this is really important because we'll probably get to some current issues. At the forefront of science, results are often wrong, not because the experimentalists are doing it, they're doing difficult work. And it's very difficult to measure things and sometimes the first measurement is, you know, isn't quite right. And so I was convinced some of the measurements were wrong, and this would be a, a message for observers to, to, to review their data and, and, and get it right. And, and some of the observers, one I remember, a guy named Saul Perlmutter said, well, you know, we'll prove you wrong. And, um, and it turned out, more, much to my surprise, more than anyone, that, it, that what we predicted was exactly right, that 70% of the energy of the universe resides in empty space. We don't know where the energy came from, why it's there, but it's there. And it's exactly the amount we predicted. And, and those guys won the Nobel Prize for the observation, which is fine because, uh, be, it, be, it, no, it is because the people who convince the world of things are the people who actually measure things. You know, we can talk, I can say it's flat, but it, or I can say there's dark energy, but no one's going to believe it unless the observers in some ways confirm that. And so physics is an empirical science. It's an experimental science. and and, and it's led by experimentalists. I say that as a theorist. Um, but in any case, so it, it turned out to be right. And, it, and I was very surprised. But, but we don't know if it's constant, if it's going to stay there. Brian said it's going to tear us apart. O only see, if the dark energy is there, one of two things can happen. It could just stay there, which is my bet, by the way. Just stay there, not change. And then it would be something that's akin to something Einstein invented called a cosmological constant, a fundamental lowest energy state of the universe. Or it could get, it could go away one day, and we talk about how that's happened earlier in the history of the universe, something very much like it. Or it could increase. Now, if it increases, then dark energy has this weird property that it's gravitationally repulsive. All of you who studied physics know that gravity sucks, okay? It always pulls pulls in. If you put energy in empty space, it blows, okay? And it causes the expansion universe to, to ex accelerate. And that's what the observers uh, uh, saw and others looking at supernova I first measured. But if it's constant, it causes the universe to accelerate. But it, it really only impacts on the evolution of the universe on the largest scales. That's why we never observed it before. You have to look at the motion of distant galaxies. But if it's increasing, its effect becomes more and more important on smaller and smaller scales. So right now it's pulling apart galaxies. The galaxies aren't being pulled apart. They're, our galaxy is the same size and it's not growing due to, even due to the expansion of the universe. But if the dark energy increases, eventually that repulsive force 
will blow apart the galaxy. And then if it keeps increasing, it'll, it'll blow apart the solar system. And then it'll blow apart planets. And then it'll eventually blow apart atoms, and it eventually will blow apart space itself. It's called the Big Rip. A, call, a, a former student, you know, in, invented the name. It's a nice name. I think there's no. I would say there's no theoretical reason to expect that at all. There's no theory that suggests that that dark energy will increase. It's a beautiful. It's a cute thing that the, you know, captured a lot of people's imagination. But it's not likely. The likelihood is either that it's staying the same, or quite possibly. It may not be a fundamental energy of empty space. It, there may be somehow being energy being stored in empty space, and it may go away, and that would change everything, including our lot. Well, including life. Yeah, but but this won't happen for several billion or perhaps trillion years. So keep paying your taxes, and do show up tomorrow night on Saturday night. You don't know because we don't understand it. It could happen tomorrow. The great thing about it is, if it ha we won't know it until we won't know it until it hits us, and we won't be there afterwards. The effect will happen at the speed of light, and so we will be go away and before we even knew we got hit. So it doesn't matter. Enjoy life. Have a, you know. Yep. Uh, get your tickets tomorrow for Saturday night. Uh, so thinking about that, and actually we're going to have a lot of friends. That's Southwest 237 flying overhead. We'll wait a second here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So... When you think about the differences between observers, experimentalists, theorists, I, I find like a lot of my students don't really comprehend the subtleties between those. But I, I think one thing is, you know, right over there, they put up a great image of Earth's nearest neighbor, the moon. And that's a view that humanity never had for thousands of years until some Dutch guy took his spectacles and broke them in two. And put one in front of the other. And then Galileo, or my hero, at least, I'm sure you're also beholden to him for intellectual debt, he turned it to the moon. And no one had ever done that before. Never looked up with a telescope until Galileo, essentially. And he saw... Yeah, that's right. Well, yeah, I mean, my neighbor was quite, quite attractive. Anyway, looking at the moon, even now, you can see it. You can use something built by a human being. You can observe something. Then you can take that observation and use it to test a hypothesis. One hypothesis that Galileo tested was whether or not that ball was actually perfectly smooth and crystalline and ideal in its form. And when he saw it wasn't, that it had mountains and it had valleys and it had holes in it and all sorts of crazy stuff, he could use that to formulate a hypothesis. And he said famously, I love this quote, he said, a scientist should measure what is measurable and then make measurable what is not yet so. I've always been curious, what do you think is the minimum amount of knowledge uh, that a, an educated lay person, and some of you are brilliant lay people, but what do you think an educated lay person should know about science? And two, what should a theoretician, like those that you train, know versus, say, an experimentalist, such as someone in my laboratory building telescopes? Now, let, let, me, let me preface this by saying physics, being the most advanced of the sciences in some ways, is probably, is, is one of the, is not the only science, but one of the only sciences where where it's so complicated, in, there's so much intellectual baggage that it has, in most areas of physics, separated into theorists and experimentalists because what you need to do to be a good experimentalist in terms of the cutting edge technology that you have to master requires a great deal of time. And similarly, the mathematical baggage that you need to, to understand fundamental science and physics is also extreme. So you don't see theorists and experimentalists. The last, in my opinion, the last great theorist experimentalist was Enrico Fermi who, who at you know, University of Chicago if you saw if you saw that movie uh, uh, Oppenheimer you would have seen Fermi he's a huge hero of mine um, and he he was he was a theorist in fact uh, um, and 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 an experimentalist equally well and he he um, he proposed uh, the fundamental theory one of the fundamental theories that later ended up describing one of the forces of nature and then did the experiments on it and won the Nobel Prize I think for his experiments. But um, anyway, it, that was the last time you could sort of do that. So it's sort of separated. In terms of the, the fundamental stuff that people should know, I really think that what we really need to teach is not the stuff that you should know, but the process by which you know it. And that's the one thing that I think is most important for people to carry on. You know, the details of science are fascinating for me and you. 
And I think for most people, once they realize it's science, you know, a lot of people don't realize they're interested in science because they don't know it's science. That's one of the reasons I wrote the Star Trek book, okay? Because, you know, I go to a party and you say, I'm a physicist, and they go, how about those Yankees or something? And then, uh, and then I'd say, you know, talk about time travel or warp drive, and, and people are fascinated. But, so that's great, and, this, and, and it really is amazing. And I guess people should, of course, the basic things people should understand about the world is that there was a Big Bang, the universe is expanding, evolution happened, basic stuff like that. But more important, the process by which we get that information, the process by which we test it, because that's the tool, those are the tools that people will carry with them in all of the areas, aspects of life. And if we just used the scientific method, then politics and, well, even religion, but politics would be, would be more sensible and more rational because people would test the ideas of politicians and say, are they telling the truth? But politicians might also develop policies based on empirical evidence and, and also be able to change their minds. Do a policy, it's not working. We're gonna change our minds. Wouldn't that be wonderful? So I think that's the kind of thing that, that we really need to teach. I wish, um, as, a, as a theorist, I've of course come to appreciate experimentalists m much more than I did when I was a, a, a student. Theorists, you know, like Oppenheimer, right? It, it's the sexy stuff, it's Einstein. And everyone, so, so somehow theorists have captured people's imaginations and the, the tinkerers, if you wish, aren't usually the heroes of the movies, but they're the heroes of science. And I kind of wish I'd, I'd, I'd as a student, appreciated that I, oh, more. I actually did a degree in mathematics and a degree in physics. And I did that for a, a variety of reasons, but one of the reasons was so I could get out of the laboratory requirement of, in physics, okay? And so, uh, but, it, but over time, of course, I've come to appreciate that. And, and as a theorist, actually, I used to be a very mathematical theorist when I was a student, a graduate student. And then uh, a friend of mine who uh, you know, Sheldon Glashow, who won the Nobel Prize. Um, I remember when I was a student, he once said to me, there's formalism and there's physics, and you have to know the difference. And, and from that time on, I've always, in my physics, tried to tie it to things you can measure and see. And that's become fundamental to me, and to try and understand what observers can do and experimentalists can do. And I, in my life, I've tried to propose new experiments because it's fascinating to learn about new technologies because every time we open a new window on the universe, we're surprised. So I think, I think if people realize the significance of that, that would be very important. But it's not the facts. It's the, it's the process. It's the tools. And I do think everyone should... The problem with... You know this. When, if you're in a physics lab, it's just like first year physics is boring in all anyways. Thing, it's, it's things sliding down inclined planes. It's, uh, but it, experimentally, it's also these recipe things. You know, here's the stuff and you do this. And it, it's not, I, it, it would be great if we could design experiments that people could discover, not know what the answer was going to be, discover, because that's really, when you're playing, that's what's really, really fun. But I think, you know, sometimes you'll hate this phrase, Lawrence, I know, but I think we should teach the controversy. And by that, I don't mean what you're thinking about, but I mean, you just mentioned this boring rolling down an inclined plane. Well, you know who came up with the formalism for that. It's my hero. We already mentioned him, Galileo. It was his final book. He was discussing relativity. He was discussing how things in relative motion cannot determine who is truly moving and who is stationary. If you're a fish in the ocean and next to a boat and the boat has an aquarium on it and there's a twin fish of yours and they're swimming, you cannot tell relative motion who is moving. He also used a genius trick by using this inclined plane, that we call it, to slow the force of gravity. Back then, they didn't have clocks. You couldn't measure things. You had your pulse. You had an hourglass. You, 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 you know, been to Florence. Yeah, I've been, I've not only been to Florence, I had a, I had a conference, hosted a conference in his prison house. And that's the controversy. Because I want to say that if you taught, like the museum there, the science, everyone goes to the art museum in Florence, but go to the Museum of Science in Florence. They have the inclined plane, they have the little telescope, which you just cannot see how he did anything. And I think they have his finger. Uh, that's in a different museum, but yes, it's his middle middle finger. I was about to do it, but I won't do it. Uh, just to that plane making noise overhead. But what I want to say is, imagine you taught people this, that Galileo's manuscript was smuggled out under penalty of death. That that manuscript that we talk about, if we told that to freshmen and, you know, and sophomores when we teach the first year students, I think it would make it more engaging. I think we do a terrible job We've been given the greatest script ever made. I mean, the greatest story ever told is your book, right? Yeah. 
but the greatest script ever handed or bestowed upon humanity is the story of science. And we are the worst actors on any stage imaginable, I feel. We need to do a better job. I need to no. Yeah. <laughs> um, we got... Well, everything I know, I need to be in. No, I, I agree with you. I actually require my students, especially the non-science students, to read Galileo. It, I always, uh, you know, would photocopy because he doesn't have the copyright anymore anyway. I'd, I'd photocopy uh, parts of the book. And, um, and I, because it read, I've, I've often said this, it's, we force these students to read like James Joyce, but Galileo is easier to read and funnier and, and poetic. And so I, I really, uh, I, I'm a huge fan of Galileo's and, and I do think it'd be great for students to read because you see how these things, which see, as you say, seem boring now, how, how he was thinking and, and seeing the thought process. And when he was wrong and when he was wrong too, he was great. Scientists, great women, great men make great mistakes. Yeah. Brilliant blunders, right? Yeah, no, no. So it, it's, uh, but you're absolutely right. The reason we do incline planes is because it's too hard to, when you drop something, it travels, it accelerates so fast. That's why Aristotle thought, you know, things immediately got their final velocity. And he said, well, if I do it on a climb plane, things will, it'll slow things down, but I can watch them accelerate. And, and, um, and it was the basis of modern science. And, and, uh, and yeah, he's, 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 at the top. I wonder if there will be new, not only new teachers for, for uh, upcoming students, but, but new, new students and new, and new ways of thinking. And I'm thinking particularly of, of large language models, of artificial intelligence. You talk about this in your latest book, The Edge of Knowledge. Hold it up so people can go to Amazon, you know, when they're not getting my book. Yeah. Liz, you had a plug. Dueling plugs. We'll see. We'll see. Um, and, and that is artificial intelligence. And I wonder... I wonder how what, how you react to this statement. When I uh, think of what Gal, uh, what Einstein, who was a successor to Galileo in many many ways, uh, not like that prick Newton, who you've written about as a as a real juror, and I learned that uh, from your writing. But uh, Einstein said, <clears throat> "Yeah, that's right. The only thing that could shut me up." So Al, Al, good old Albert, uh, he said that he had his happiest experience, its happiest thought ever, was that somebody in free fall would experience no gravitational force. And that led him to construct the Einstein equivalence principle and everything in GR follows from that. But you know, what people don't realize is that he said that, but he said that I mean, the only time his heart ever had palpitations, and this is what's important. I mean, I think Einstein was sort of working this vacuum. They all think, you know, theoretical physicists are alone at night just coming up with things but he was tied to observation and experiment. And, and the moment that he, he wrote down this beautiful theory, but that didn't give him palpitations, even though it was beautiful. And he once said, if he knew it could be wrong because it was so beautiful. But although most theorists say that about their own work and most of them are wrong. But, um, but he said, when, when he did the calculation for general relativity and discovered something called the perihelion of Mercury, Mercury's orbit sort of rotates very slowly, a few seconds of arc, Per century, but it would, no one could understand it. Newton's laws didn't give it, and he did the calculation in general relativity, and it came up with the exact number that people had observed. That's when he said he had heart palpitations and almost fainted. He, that's it was realizing that he had, he you know it agreed with observation, and that so n physics isn't done in this vacuum. It depends on the observations of the time. Very very rarely theorists lead, but. But, uh, uh, you know, even Einstein wasn't, was certainly a product of his time. And his, his earlier theory of special relativity, people, I, I hate the way it's taught in schools. And, and, and I've written in my books of different ways of t teaching it because of planes. Tried to get that to reroute traffic just for tonight, but they said we're too loud. But, you know, everyone says, okay, the speed of light is a constant. In fact, I got asked by someone the other day, or it's kind of, what if, you know, what if, the, what if we find the speed of light isn't constant or something? He didn't just say, oh, the speed of light is constant and therefore the world is crazy. What he realized was two things. In fact, it's good you mentioned Galileo. Galileo told us just what you just said, Galilean relativity. If you're on a plane and the windows are closed and you throw up a ball, you don't know you're moving. We don't know. We think we're standing still, but we're moving at 30 kilometers per second around the sun. We feel like we're standing still because Galileo told us there's no experiment you can do that will tell if you're moving or standing still, if you're moving at a constant velocity or standing still. It, I say you're moving, you say I'm moving, it doesn't matter. That's Galilean relativity, it's true, it's been tested. 
James Clerk Maxwell developed electromagnetism, this theory of electromagnetism, and for reasons I won't go into right now, but I could, but I'm not going to. It turns out the theory of electromagnetism is, a is our prototypical, most beautiful theory we have in physics almost. It was inconsistent with Galileo. You couldn't have Maxwell and Galileo at the same time. And it was thinking about that that forced him to the theory of relativity. The only way to make Galileo and Maxwell consistent was to do crazy things to space and time. So he was driven to it by thinking about the observations of time. So if, if, Max, if Einstein had been born, you know, Maxwell was like 50 years before Einstein. If, if he'd been born 80 years earlier, he wouldn't have been Einstein, okay? Uh, one of my favorite anecdotes about Einstein is that he was offered the presidency of Israel. And can you imagine what kind of a career he could have had if he was the president of Israel? <laughs> uh, but I, I, I wanted to make one point about this and get your reaction to it. So here's Einstein. He's saying you're free fall. You can't feel this uh, gravitational force that you're in motion. And it was this delightful, visceral experience that he had. How can my iPhone running chat GPT, as it often is, how can it experience heart palpitations? How can it have a happiest thought? How can it visualize the sensation of free fall? Uh, what I'm getting at, can we have, and I asked this of your friend Noam Chomsky when he was a, you know, can you have creativity of a physical variety that without embodiment? Well, no, in fact, again, I was talking about this the other day. I, I think it's quite likely, and I talk about it in the new book, I, I think it's quite likely that, that systems, AI systems, if they ever could be self-aware and conscious, will not be able to do it unless they have feelings, and feelings will require uh, sensors that can sense the outside world and the internal state of the system. That's what, what's developed in us, the homeostatic system. We can sen started sensing pain and pleasure, but beyond that, we, uh, we sense the world, and then those physical feelings turn into emotional feelings, and I think it's quite likely that you won't see a, a, a chat GPT or a static regurgitational system that can't sense the world. Now, can you sense the world through the internet? Maybe at some level, but, uh, but I do think that that, that consciousness, that self-awareness requires that, that, that um, connection to the world. The interesting question is whether it'll become an emotional connection or not, and, and who knows? Can you have emotions? Are emotions independent? If you could choose between one or the other, emotions or visceral sensations, what well, would you choose? You know, who know? I mean, it's, it, we do know that amoebas don't have, um, you know, don't feel... No, Stephen Hawking didn't well, have those things. I, I debate this, you know, uh, with some neuroscientists, m my dog, and I was just actually, tonight there's a podcast dropping with Robert Sapolsky on our, our podcast from his new book about free will. Um, and and Sapolsky agrees with me, our dogs, you know, have emotions and feel bad and good. I'm convinced of it. Not just Levi, but all of them. <laughs> Well, who knows what cats are thinking? If they were bigger, they would eat us, right? Or, or, uh, in, yeah, you, you can't tell what cats are thinking. So what if you were a beginning graduate student right now or a smart undergraduate, there's some here tonight, and there's even some you know, pre-freshmen over there. I see some of the young people over there. The youngster, the future is right there. What, what excites you about science nowadays? You were starting off, uh, you, somebody asked you, what would you do? A 20-year-old started getting into science, brilliant, smart, whatever, has the gifts, privilege, whatever. What do you advise them to do? Well, you know, the, of course, I should I'd advise them to do what they like to do, which is the first thing, because they're not going to be good at it unless they enjoy it. But, but one, of things that I, one of the things I would tell them to think about, which I unfortunately, well, I did what I did, but when I was growing up, I, my mother wanted me to be a doctor, of course, and I thought I was going to be a doctor, and I took biology in high school. And I dropped it after two weeks because we dissected frogs and memorized the parts of frogs. Wait, wait a second. I, 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 a Jewish mother wanted you to be a doctor? Oh, not only did she want me to be a doctor, I think I've told this story. I, when I got my first job at Harvard, which was the best job in the country at the time, um, my mother phoned up my, my first wife at the time that day when I was out of there and said, he can still become a doctor. <laughs> and uh, anyway, she was pregnant for a long time. But... Um, Anyway, so uh, I went into biology class and it was memorizing the parts of a frog. And I hate mem. I, the reason I like physics is you don't have to memorize anything, uh, in principle. And and so I, I, 
I feel cheated in a way because, of course, DNA had been discovered. You know, I was a child of this at that age in the 60s, and DNA had been discovered a decade earlier. But, of course, in high school, it usually takes 20 to 30 years to get into the books. And I didn't realize what an incredibly exciting field it is. So nowadays, in fact, when I, when I was doing my PhD, I did it at MIT, um, as one does, I think, and as one I hope one does, I got discouraged many times. And I think students should get discouraged. If they're not getting discouraged, then they're not really pushing the edge of the envelope. And I thought of doing, and my mother would have been thrilled, I thought of doing a joint MD-PhD, which you could do at Harvard, MIT. And so I went to uh, the, the cousin of a friend of mine who was the chair of cell biology. I, wanted to, I was going to do biophysics. You know, I liked fundamental physics, but I was getting so discouraged. So I went to see him, and this was in 1980, 81, so maybe late 70s, early 80s. And, and I said to him, you know, should I do this? And he said, don't do biophysics. And I said, why? And he said, because it's not of interest to biologists and it's not of interest to physicists. That was true in 1979. But now it's really one of the most exciting forefront areas of physics because biology is becoming an area where physicists are learning to study physical processes. And of course, the tools of physics are being used in biology. So it's an incredibly exciting area. So I would not, I would say, you know, and of course, genetics and genomics and combinatorics and genetics and along with AI, an incredibly exciting area. And, and, and the, 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 the disciplines of the 19th century disciplines are disappearing. So the interface between physics and biology is disappearing. And, and so the, the, I would argue that there's a whole spectrum from biology to fundamental physics. And in, in the kind of physics that, if you ask me what are the sort of growth areas, one is manipulating quantum systems. We can manipulate quantum systems like we could never do before. Some of it involves quantum computers. Some of it involves making new materials that might do just what you wanted to do. Um, of course, astrophysics is a, and cosmology are growth areas because we have all these new tools. But ultimately, though, I think what, you know, I would come back and say what, well, I would say try a bunch of things. When students ask me where they should go to graduate school, I often say go to a school that has a lot of different programs so you can see what you might like. And it's a, I often say it's more important who you work with than what you work on because your advisor and you develop a tight relationship. Since we're in the Air and Space Museum, the best one in the world, uh, I want to uh, run a topic by you. There's something called the von Karman line, which is loosely defined. People are here more expert than me, but it's loosely defined as a boundary between space and, and the Earth's atmosphere. And it seems to me that, you know, kind of the, the most pressing problems that, that are uh, being approached by physicists, and you worked on some of these, all happen below the von Karman line. And I'm talking about nuclear war. I'm talking about uh, pandemics that spread through atmosphere transmission and, uh, and, and, and climate change. So you've written books on at least two of the three of these things. I await your biophysics uh, book, which is undoubtedly being worked on as we speak. But, but of these things, can you rank them? Are, is, is what you were, I should say, the, the uh, chairman of the board of atomic science, of the Bolton of Atomic Scientists, which is one of the foremost agencies founded by Oppenheimer himself. Um, and uh, what keeps you up at night? I mean, I often say, you know, the problem with physics is that we saved the world. You know, we, we created the atomic bomb. But that, that's, been, that's not clear if it, I said, deeply regretted it. Oppenheimer had some regrets. It's not really clear exactly what he regretted. Uh, you and Shelley Glashow have written about this. Pandemics. Let's talk about that. I mean, is science... Science has made the world a better place. To deny that, I think, is ridiculous. People in this audience are alive who would not be alive to be here 100 years ago if it weren't for science. And more people eat and are, are, are able to survive a, a, and live a higher quality of life because of science. We can do amazing things. We can communicate around the world. We can, we can experience things we could never experience. Someone with a, with a phone in a, even a poor village and in Africa and experienced parts of the world they never could experience before, where most people in the world never, for most of human history, never walked more than 10 kilometers from where they lived. So, yeah, and of course, along with technology can come problems. And how we address that is, a, is unfortunately not a scientific question, it's a political question. So the politics of dealing with these questions is much harder than the scientific ones. 
the technologies of dealing with climate change are much easier to consider than the politics of implementing them. Um, I don't, I never rank things. Uh, um, and, and all of those things um, concern me. I think nuclear war is still, in my mind, the, the, the most immediate. And, and it, it gets poor, well, maybe now it's not, but it, it, it amazes me that people sort of um, don't, it, well, I'll tell you how it happens. Every time, I, as, as you, as you know, I, or may know, you know, I, I wrote, I've written for lots of newspapers over the years. And every time I wrote an article about nuclear war or nuclear weapons, it had the least response of any, of any of the pieces I wrote. I think people don't want to think about it. But people don't realize that there are, it, right now, a thou, at least a thousand warheads in the United States and Russia that are on trigger hair alert ready to be launched on, on, if, a, if a perceived signal of another launch is perceived. And, and, and that also, as people did learn when, when that guy was president a few years ago, um, that the, 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 the command and control infrastructure in this country is such the only person who can issue a launch for uh, order to launch into global is the president. And no other organization, no, it doesn't have to go by anyone else. There's no other individual who can who could override that unless they decide the president's crazy but in the actual organization there's no there's no uh you know no other people are going to say hold on so i do think it's amazing as it's amazing that we've been around for 70 some odd years without the use of nuclear weapons and maybe mutually assured destruction is is part of the reason but it's a it's a problem and it's a problem we can address but it's a political problem but you know saying that scientists create the problem you know, Steve Pinker had a great analogy. He said it's like it's like blaming architects for Dachau. You know, you had to have architects to design the concentration camps. Is 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 are concentration camps a necessary product of architecture? No. And so I think I think it's really you have to think about it carefully before you point those fingers. Before I want to ask you a question though, but for a second, you you asked me. Um, what people should know. Yeah, people should know when to stop talking. Yes, but um, and my wife tells me that all the time, actually. But um, uh, 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 what do you think people should, what, as an experimentalist, do you think people should, you know, what do you think people should know in, 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 in science in school? Well, I mean, I think for me, the most important things uh, that that people should have as a scientist, first of all, and I'll speak to that first, is humility. But I don't think you can only have humility. I think you need a little bit of, I call it swagger. Maybe it's arrogance that you can actually attempt to take on problems that even Einstein was unable to solve. And hopefully, you know, maybe even people in this room can approach and solve it. And it's not an exclusive sect of a high priesthood that can't be approached except by the ordained uh, members of a certain sect. Uh, but I also think that we should also not fool ourselves. We're mostly wrong. I mean, it's amazing how much we've been able to do, you know, to come in, uh, in a few decades to, you know, from the first transistor. If you look at the first transistor invented in 1956, the first practical transistor, Shockley, Bardeen, et cetera, uh, it looks like uh, the following thing. Go and get some bazooka bubble gum, chew it up, and go down to the dry cleaner and get a wire hanger and stick it together on a piece of rock. And that's exactly what it looks like. Yeah. And now each and every one of you has 14 billion of them in your pocket right now, except for maybe the kids, but maybe, you know, maybe they even do it now. They probably do. And they know how to use it better than you do. Right? That's right. When I, I first got worried about technology, when one of my kids was looking at me and I was just staring into her beautiful eyes as only a three-year-old could, could have this perfect, innocent face and, and then she reached up to touch me, and I was welling up to tears. And then, and then she tried to swipe, and and you know, change the change my image. Uh, but but I think that we should know that you know you need to be we need to be humble. We're often wrong, uh, but the progress gets made you know exponentially, and we just are not capable of thinking with our lin linear limited brains of the pace of change. And I think that is the hardest thing. I think scientists, the public, should know that a good scientist should often say, as your tutor, as your mentor, Richard Feynman said, you know, science is the belief in the ignorance of experts, 
Not the knowledge, not the wisdom, but the ignorance that actually Lawrence wouldn't have been able to create this concept of dark energy had someone gotten to it first or been right that there actually is no such thing as dark energy. So you doubted that person, it was Einstein at one point, and you proved that wrong, or you conjecture that he indeed may be wrong. And I think that's incredibly powerful that you have to realize science is done by people and human beings, despite the contrary, right? Yeah, and I, you know, the first, I said it the other day, the first three words in the book are the most important words in science, or I don't know. They, but, but actually, what we really should get across, you made a good point. Most ideas are wrong. Most experiments are wrong when they're first done, and that's okay. The press never do, gets that. I, I, w I was castigating the press the, the other day, not, because they all, you know, someone gets an absurd result, and their university does, press re office sends it out, and then simply because most papers don't have enough money to have science reporters anymore, the science reporters just take the press release and publish it, and it's nonsense, and you read it as a scientist, and you know it's nonsense. And then, and then it's wrong, but no one ever writes that story later on. They just show another result that disagrees with it, and it gives people the idea that science is, is faddish. It's hard. If, if, it, if, if, it was, if, if, it was, if, if you weren't wrong most of the time, anyone could do science. I mean, that's... But, but anyone can do science, right? I mean, it shouldn't be this exclusive thing that's only populated by uh, Einstein. And it doesn't mean that you guys can all go out there, you know, I, I, Einstein says a lot of things, right? One of the things he says was imagination is more important than all. But, you know, I don't know about you when I go to my, you know, gastroenterologist, I don't want to say, I'm going to try this new procedure I've been waiting to try. <laughs> Would you mind if I imagined it? No. But, but I do think it's, it is important to have, uh, we don't want, uh, people mistake this. They, they, everybody, have you heard famously uh, Eisenhower's farewell address where he warned about the dangers of a, what did he talk about? He talked about a military industrial complex. That very same farewell speech, he warned about the dangers of a technological scientific elite that would do things to promote their own interests and keep it shielded. And I often say that you and I, as every scientist who's paid by the public, has a moral obligation to share what he or she does. Not to be professional communicators like, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson or, you know, Michio Kaku or whoever you like, uh, Jan Levin or somebody, but, but, but who should give back to some proportion what they receive from the public. I, I wouldn't say it moral. I might say ethical. I might I, I, maybe a political responsibility. But you know, look, I, I've spent a lot of my life explaining science, and I and I and I enjoy doing it. And I, but I don't think, I think I actually think what young science because the young people who want to do what I'm doing say say how do, how do how can I do what you're doing? And I always say to them, do good science. If you're a young scientist and you're a good scientist, what you should do is spend your time on science. Now. If you're interested in reaching the public and explaining things, the more science you do, the better, more opportunities you'll have to then reach out. But, but I think most scientists actually do want to, but feel uncomfortable. It's very, the first time you, you talk out, academia is a very safe environment. People that pretend it isn't, but it is. It's an ultimately self it's a, it's a safest environment. And so when you go out in the public, it can be terrifying. And I understand that. And so I don't think everyone should be in fact, I remember when the National Science Foundation once had some requirement. I, when I was chair at, of CASE, where you went, um, young faculty I have come in, they'd get, apply for these awards from the National Science Foundation, and they'd, they'd have to have a part of their plan, which was an outreach plan. Now, I'm a big believer in outreach, but this was nonsense, because these got, people were postdocs. They'd never been involved in outreach. They, did, they were really interested in doing their work, and they'd come up with these cockamamie plans none of which ever happened. And, and I think forcing them to do that is crazy. There are people who are talented at it and naturally like to do it like anything else and will do a good job. But there are, most, there are many of my colleagues I would far prefer not have a, a the public would be better off if they didn't hear them. <laughs> so we talked about a lot of things. Uh, a few more minutes the two of us can chat about. Um, prerequisite for most podcasts, talk about I. Uh, but also talk about something that has those two letters, AI, and that's aliens. Um, I haven't talked to you about this very much. No. I'm going to do, I'm going to do an event in New York on, on December 1st, not debating because I stopped debating UFO people, 
but I'm having a dialogue with a guy named Nick Pope. Oh, isn't he the inspiration for someone in the X Files or something? Yeah, was, I mean, I may have been Mulder or Scully. I hope it was hope it was Scully and not Mulder. But anyway, well, let's talk about that. So, one thing that's always bemused me maybe is the fact that the public's fascination did sort of start to you know initiate around the time of the atomic bomb program, uh, right after, and it was in the same part of the country. Roswell is not far from Alamogordo and from uh, Los Alamos. So uh, what do you make of this recent resurgence? Um, give it, uh, what do you make of the testimony? And, the, and, the, and, and one of my friends is here tonight, a fighter pilot in the U.S. Navy, who uh, did a podcast with another fighter pilot who, who claims to have encountered uh, certain things or have eyewitness reports about that. Uh, what do you make of all this? Well, I'll, I'll tell you what Feynman said, and I've always subscribed to this. Um, he said, I think, you know, UFOs are aliens, UFOs being attributed to aliens. It's kind of amazing when you think about it. So you see something up in the sky, you don't know what it is, it's immediately aliens. Okay? Now, uh, let me give two aspects of that. What Feynman said is, I think UFOs are more likely, and I, the other day I was explaining to the audience that physicists say more likely or less likely, we don't, but UFOs are much more likely due to the known irrationality of humans rather than the unknown rationality of aliens. And I think that's, and he said that because uh, if you think about it, and I guess one of my books, I think beyond Star Trek, I talked about this a great length, almost anything you can think of, regardless of how absurd it may seem, as an explanation of what people may see out there, is more likely than it's, it's aliens coming here to, to, to Earth. So almost anything you can think of is more likely. The laws of physics are such, the known laws of physics, forget the unknown laws of physics, the known laws of physics put constraints that make it so unlikely that anything you can think of, it's like the magic bullet in the Kennedy assassination, anything is more likely than it, that it's aliens. And I, the way I, I like to think of it this way, to, to come for an alien spaceship powered by fuel inside the spaceship, to come here from a distant star at nearest light speed would require harnessing essentially the power output of a star. I have a hard time thinking they come all the way here to abduct patients of some Harvard psychiatrist and do kinky experiments on them. I mean, it just seems like a big waste of time to me. So it's almost eight o'clock. Uh, yeah, let me ask you one question. It's almost eight o'clock. We should end. I keep losing my microphone. Okay. I, I, I do want to ask you one question, an experimental question. Because you got to ask me a bunch here, but I did want to say, what experimentally, in, and it gives you a chance to maybe talk about your own work too, but what experimentally do you think is the next, what technology is going to be most useful in, in your area of physics or in physics in general that you're aware of? Yeah. So, you know, I'm an experimental cosmologist, which means I build universes in the laboratory. No, I don't build universes. We build telescopes that have technology to do it like Galileo did with the telescope to reveal things deeper and farther and uh, more exotic than what we could perceive close to home. And the project that I'm privileged to be leading is called the Simons Observatory, which is a $100 million plus experiment in the high Atacama Desert of Chile, where we are going to attempt to be the first instrument to do something that's never been done before, which is to measure the actual spark that ignited the Big Bang. And it shares some properties in common with dark energy uh, that Lawrence mentioned earlier, uh, but it could provide a whole host of cosmic observables that would answer a lot of questions that cosmologists and lay people have had. And one of my philosophies as, a, as, a, as an advisor to my students is reach, you know, reach for the stars, as Casey Kasem said, but keep your feet on the ground. And, and that to me means uh, do something really ambitious, like measure what actually banged, who banged, she banged. No, no, I don't know if she banged. Uh, but but <laughs> yeah, we'll keep it clean. Uh, it's her uh, um, uh, famous pop song. Uh, but the question is, is there something safe that you also get no matter what? And for us, that's measuring the mass of these ghostly particles called neutrinos that we've known about for 100 years. This is neat. But I would like you, But what I really would like you to do, because it's, it's, these are, these, you see now people say this is great, but why don't you say how you're going to do it? I think that's, that's really neat because, you know... It, what technology, you know, I know, but I think it's worth explaining what, you're, what the Simon's observing. So I'll do, I'll do a little demo here. So I brought a handy dandy flashlight, which you can hopefully see in the back. I won't blind you. It has a blinding mode, which is kind of cool. If Lawrence gets out of hand, I'll blast. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to blast you. So if you have a light source, you can use that light source to illuminate everything 
not only about where the light source itself was created, but everything it encounters along the way. Here it's my finger, or here it's this uh, vodka Coke. No, no, it's just plain Coke. Um, and, and so you can learn about it by, by knowing something about the source of light and its, and its primitive state, and then how it has been transformed by the medium, the material along its path, if you can detect it. So we build the most sensitive detectors ever made that can see literally uh, this flashlight on the moon in, in appropriate units uh, from here in, on the planet Earth. We don't have to launch a satellite. It's not like the Webb telescope. It's much, much less expensive, although pretty expensive. And we cool down these ultra-sensitive detectors. Instead of like your eye, Galileo's eye, looking through a telescope, we look through telescopes with very, very sensitive, highly sophisticated quantum devices called superconducting bolometer. And we built those here in San Diego. We shipped them down to Chile. They just took their first astronomical image of the moon. And if you saw it, you'd be hardly impressed because it just looks like almost like a, uh, like a bell curve, and that's about it. But that's the first wispy indications that we are on the right track to actually unveil both the properties of the extremely early universe and then the late universe, neutrinos, exotic particles, forces, fields, energy, and matter. And what's really fun is we get paid to really, not to prove people like Lawrence right, but to actually prove everybody else wrong, perhaps. And then the last woman or man standing, that theory is the one that for a provisional period of time is entitled to enjoy some attention until some other theory comes along and experiment to supplant it. So it's, to me, it's the most exciting time to be. There's many other telescopes, the Vera Rubin, Nancy Grace observatories, these are space and ground, respectively. The theorist, I, I mean, and this would happen, as I say, well after I graduated, but the other thing that's worth important saying to the students and everyone else too, is I, I certainly learned a lot more physics after I got my PhD than I did before. And I learned a lot about experimental physics because to me it fascinates me. And I remember before you were even a student at Case, uh, talking about the importance of bolometers and, and we proposed bolometers to look for dark matter. And it was amazing to me to see what you could do with, you know, superconducting technology and bolometers. And it's, and, and, but, but by the same token, that's why I'm a theorist because that was 40 years ago. And then all the experiments just have to work for 40 years, and I just have to write the paper in 1985, and I could do go do something else. So, so we're gonna uh, break for a little bit. So this is actually from an 11-year-old who asked uh, a good question: Are any of the meteorites you handed out radioactive? <laughs> and do you know have any thoughts about that? Uh, so meteorite radioactivity. Well, what's interesting about it is that they were sort of formed thanks to a nuclear processes, a radioactive process, well, not radioactive, but nuclear processes. Now, when a star of a certain size, a certain girth, uh, gets to the end of its lifetime, it no longer can support its massive body that it's built up over billions of years. And something called a type two supernova occurs where the material that makes up the outer la layers, uh, no longer is supported by the pressure, the weight of the outer material is no longer supported by the heat, the heat pressure keeping the nuclear fires going. And that happens when it makes iron. When the star makes, fuses two lighter nuclei together to make iron, silicon, I think, uh, or silicon oxygen, you make iron 56, and that is no longer exothermic, doesn't give off energy, and then the star collapses and then explodes back and the most luminous explosions since the Big Bang, and these could be seen from across the entire uh, universe, essentially. So this material is billions of years old because it's a material that was made the last thing a star ever did. It's like, what's the last thing that goes through a fly's mind before it dies on your windshield? It's bud. Get it? Okay. Anyway, uh, this material is mostly iron, so it's not radioactive, and it is, uh, it is the pristine material that shares something in common with your blood because the iron in your blood came from the same supernova process that produced these iron meteorites. So this stuff is magnetic, it is not radioactive, and you should play around with it if you are so inclined and you will not get endangered. I have my word, as a I'm a doctor also, by the way. So, well, let me, let, me, let me make a slight correction there. Um, everything is radioactive, uh, and I, I think, and, and so, there's radioactivity coming from your big toe. Um, small amounts of it, trace amounts of radioactivity everywhere. One of the big problems in making particle physics, new 
experiments to look at things like dark matter is to get rid of the radioactivity. It's really hard because we're looking for events that are so, so rare that if there's a little bit of radioactivity in this big tank, then it'll overwhelm the thing we're looking for. So even, even if, um, and I think I once, I, a book I wrote again, well, yeah, before you were an undergraduate. Um, I are, in fact, we were looking for things in dark matter detectors. We're looking for events that are about a million times smaller in rate than the radioactivity in your big toe. And so there's a little bit of radioactivity in everything, and that's okay. Um, even if it's just impurities. It depends on, uh, on things. And, and so, you know, and there's also stuff coming from up there, cosmic rays. So I, I have a little Geiger counter I like to take with me around places to see when I was up in Greenland looking and stuff. But anyway, so there's a little bit of radioactivity, but nothing, but, the, but this is iron, which in general is not a radioactive. The dominant stuff here is, the, is, the, is iron, which is, the, which is the most stable, and in some ways the most stable of the heavy elements at all. Okay, this one we can both answer too, I think. Uh, maybe I'll start. Brendan asks, if aliens were to exist, how much more intelligent than us would they be, or could they reach us even with less intelligence? The, the answer to the first question is we don't know. We have no idea if they exist, whether they're more intelligent or less intelligent or intelligent. Um, the ones where, it, if, if, they're, if they're far less intelligent, we have much less likelihood of finding out about them because the way that other aliens would find out about us and why most of the universe doesn't know we exist is they'd look for the, is they'd look for the radio transmissions that we've emitted. And we've only been doing that for 100, 150 years. And that means since it traveled the speed of light, if you're more than 150 light years away from us, which is most of the galaxy, you know, we, there's nothing special about the Earth. So we might learn about other kinds of life, but intelligent life we'd require to be at least technological, at least as technological as us. Now, one might say, and I'm going to only talk a little bit because you can add, um, one of the things we'd say is, look, our sun is only four and a half billion years old. Our, our, our Earth is four and a half billion years old, our solar system. And the galaxy is about 12 billion years old. So you might say that most, most stars are a lot older than our, our sun, and a lot of them are. Um, and therefore, civilizations could be billions of years older than us. And that's true, maybe. But the problem is, in order to have the iron that Brian was just talking about, stars have to explode. In order to have all the materials that make up the Earth, stars had to explode, and it takes time. And so, it, it, in the early history of our galaxy, there, wasn't, there weren't many heavy elements that would make up rocky planets. It takes time. And, and there are many, you can argue that most of the atoms in your body went through maybe 10 different stellar explosions before the one that may have produced us now. And that takes time. So it could be that there aren't many more uh, civilizations that are, uh, you know, as old as us, because it took four billion years for intelligence to arise on Earth. And so we, but the neat thing is we don't know. And in a situation like that, the only way to find out is to look and let the universe tell us. And if we don't, as Carl Sagan would say, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. It just means you have to build a better experiment. And Brian knows all about that. You, 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 not seeing something often means you just have to do a better job and, and technology improves at a great rate, so you can. Anyway, you can add to that. Yeah, I mean, I would just say if you plotted the history of the universe and you plotted intelligence, even on Earth, there was a long, maybe dominant portion of Earth's history when dolphins were more intelligent than the Denisovans and Australopithecai and all sorts of other things, or their predecessors maybe, because they've been around longer than, than human beings or Homo sapiens sapiens have been around for. So the question is not maybe more or less intelligent, but technological. Because no matter what, the dolphins can keep evolving, but you're not going to do, you know, build a uh, Falcon Heavy underwater and have to do metallurgy. You're not going to have technology without the opposable thumbs that we have. So they may be even more intelligent things than us in the universe, although there's zero evidence for that right now. I think that's the best thing we can say. We don't know, um, but these things that manipulate space and time to get here, uh, they are subject to the fundamental laws of physics, thermodynamics, et cetera, which 
we have great confidence, will never be overturned. But I think there is a fallacy that because there's so many stars out there, you and I have talked about this, there has to be life. And I told you, and you've been to Antarctica or Canada, I don't know which one is colder, uh, you're from Canada, uh, but, uh, but I've been there, there's very little life there. Well, there's a lot of extreme, what we've learned is, it, is there's life in extreme environments you'd never imagine there'd be life in, in acid, in boiling water, in cold, life seems to be able to fill every niche that's possible. So in fact, uh, I suspect strongly, now this is an intelligent life, that there's, that there's um, microbial life elsewhere in our solar system. I would be surprised if underneath the oceans of, Euro of Europa or Enceladus, we didn't find evidence of microbial life. And, and it would be very fascinating. And, uh, and we can talk, we'll be back here and see if he's right in five more years. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we'll, we'll find it. I will say as a pessimist, which I am in general, um, although I, I, yeah, see, there's a reason to be a pessimist. Um, my late friend, who's a, a writer named Cormac McCarthy, was a very um, wrote very dark books that some of you may have read or seen movies based on his work. And when I first met him, he was a very cheerful guy. And I asked him how he could be so cheerful. And he said, I'm a pessimist, but that's no reason to be gloomy. Anyway, um, this is a quick question, but I, f I have to answer because it, it comes from a nine-year-old who I know, Arnie, who and it's, said, how did you know that the card I was thinking of was the six of spades? And the answer is, I tricked you. <laughs> Angela asks, oh, this is a, this is, well, this is probably a question for me, but um, is dark energy potential energy or kinetic energy? If it's one of the two, how is it measured? That's a, that's a really good question. Energy, if you, if you took high school physics, energy comes in, in a bunch of different forms. That one form is the energy of motion. You know, if I throw a ball at you and it hits you, it's got energy and it can do work on you, knock you over. That comes from kinetic energy. If I lift a ball up in the air, it's got the potential to do work if I let it go by falling on you. And that's potential energy. And if you were going to say that it, dark energy is more potential energy, it's not due to motion. In fact, there's nothing to move. That's the weird thing. It's the energy of empty space, so there's nothing there to move. So it's potential energy. But how it's measured, um, well, there are different ways, and, and we're looking. And one of the things, you know, Simons might do will, may help on that. The, the way it was first discovered was the fact that dark energy, as I said, is gravitationally repulsive, and it causes the universe to expand ever faster. And by looking at distant objects and seeing how, they're, how fast they're moving away from me, us, as a function of their distance, and therefore the time we look back in the history of the universe, because it takes light finite time to get to us, we can map out the expansion rate of the universe and discover, to the surprise of the observers, that the universe is speeding up. And the amount by which it speeds up is directly related to the amount of dark energy there is. And, and that's, that's the first way to measure it. There are other ways. And one of the other ways is to, again, always looking at the history of the universe, kind of doing, doing arche universal archaeology, which is really kind of what Brian does, is to look at state by state and, and try and look at how individual objects are evolving, like galaxies. And all of those things depend on the expansion rate of the universe. So lots of different measurements are trying to be performed to see if that dark energy is really constant, which I'm convinced it is, but, but we'll need experiments to see. Do you want to add anything to that? Okay. Um, here's one we could both talk about, although we, well, anyway, I'm not sure we have much to say, but how advanced is AI versus what is used by the public? I, I think you're meaning how advanced is, are there secret AIs that are much more advanced than they're used by the public? I actually don't think so. Um, I mean, because the AI systems are, are really produced by companies that are hoping to make money. And, um, and so they're using, they, they require a lot of money and they have to use the publicly available information. They mine the internet to try and figure out, to predict what the next word you're gonna say is, or the next word they should say to you. That's all they do, is they just try and predict the probability of the next word, the, the, at least the AI that you're, that, that most of you are familiar with, Chat GPI. And it's pretty basic, although it's quite amazing what it can do. And, um, and in fact, I don't know what, it's okay to say it. Brian, when I talked to him earlier by email about what he was gonna ask me, he asked Chat GPT the questions he should ask me. And I said, I didn't think they were as good as the questions we could come up with, but they're still pretty good. Yeah, I, on my website, I put, um, I made a, a Brian bot 
I took all every all of my books, all of my podcasts, transcripts, solo episodes with you, me, Joe Rogan, every, and I put it all into there. And now I no longer have to tell my kids bedtime stories. So I would go home, check in in a few minutes. No, but uh, one thing that they are doing that we don't really do, we meaning normal people, uh, the coders and, and people actually doing sophisticated, uh, you know, uh, software engineering, computer science and so forth. They are using, you know, they are extracting more information, I think, than I do when I ask it, you know, what are the, you know, the top 10 reasons that you should become a cosmologist or, or so forth, or the questions to ask a renowned physicist, Lawrence Krauss. Um, I find it very enjoyable. I think it's really fun and, and useful, but I'm worried that they're actually going to get dumber with time, and it's a phenomenon we observe in high-performance computing. The better the computers get due to Moore's law, the more people want to use those really powerful computers, and that saps their efficiency at putting out new data analysis, new papers, and so forth. What's happening with AI until just a week or two ago, ChatGPT wasn't trained on the internet before 2021. And I always say, why not 2021? And that's when GPT-1 came out. So now they're actually training, uh, the, the, these are crawling the web, and they're processing things written by AIs. And that, that's kind of gonna bring up maybe kind of like what happened with mad cow disease, except mad bot disease. They're gonna start to really get kind of hallucinogenic and it could be uh, reduce their efficacy. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, and I will say to, to promote, I'm not sure when it's going to come out, but I recorded a, a really fascinating episode with one of the most remarkable computer scientists I know, a theoretical computer scientist named Scott Aronson. And, um, and he's now got a interested in AI safety and, and doing some really neat things. And we talked about it. So it'll come out in the next month or two. He's a really neat guy, really deep, a very deep thinker. I'm very impressed with him. Okay, um, Kim says, I read somewhere that quantum entanglement could be key to teleportation. What are your thoughts on that? Do you see this becoming a reality? Has it already, and I just missed it? Uh, that's kind of a Star Trek question. It, 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 you know, I remember when I first heard about quantum teleportation. I mean, it was brilliant. It was brilliant marketing of the, of the physicists who did it, because every journalist in the world would then, well, a lot of them at the time called me because of the Star Trek book, but... but it, the quantum teleportation and teleportation are two very different things. In fact, the fact that we can do quantum teleportation is the very same reason that we can't do people teleportation. Okay? Quantum mechanical systems are very, very special. It takes a lot of work to observe quantum mechanical properties. You have to very carefully prepare systems, very, very carefully. Experimentalists have to do a lot of work, which is why they won the Nobel Prize last year for, for the work they're doing to to isolate the quantum properties, the weird quantum properties of quantum systems. And they're weird because we don't see them. And one of the reasons we don't see them is we're not isolated systems. I'm interacting with you and the light in this room and all the particles in my body are interacting. We are the worst possible. We're not in a, in a, in a, in a nice, simple quantum mechanical state. So for certain very simple quantum mechanical systems, we can do something that looks like teleportation. Like we affect, we measure the properties of a particle here, it instantaneously affects the properties that you will measure of a particle over there. It sounds like information is being processed faster than light. That's not true. It just happens. There's nothing, there's no message you could ever send from here to there that would be faster than light. But it's only possible because it's a very, very carefully prepared system and you don't allow it to interact with the environment all the way in between. And so we are not carefully prepared quantum mechanical systems. So we are not going to be teleported and it's not going to happen. And as much as I'd like it to happen, and I, especially as I'm on planes a lot, I love to be able to be teleported, but it's not going to happen. Do you have anything else? No, just that we wouldn't know if you were actually from the future uh, teleporting back in, in the past just to play a trick on Kim, which we pre-prepared that quantum question. No, I'm just kidding. Nothing else to add. Let's see the next one. I, okay, I'm not going to talk about time, time travel. I did the other day, so... Um, uh, this is one I think you can, well, we'll both answer, but I think you could probably address it interestingly enough, given you just mentioned the Simon thing is $100 million. It happens to be funded by individuals, but as well as the government. But anyway, the question is, how should one respond to inquiries about why the public should fund costly physics experiments? Well, I mean, I think one statistic that, you know, GPT told me, and I assume it's true, is that you know, the budget for NASA is less than what you ladies and maybe a few gentlemen spend on lipstick every year. Uh, it's a very small portion. And 
people are confused by that because they see all the great things NASA does. Look at the moon. You know, we've been on there, and there's other NASA things, the Apollo thing that you guys were in for the VIP earlier. Um, so it seems like this huge, you know, it must be costing a tremendous amount. It's actually quite small. And increasingly, more and more are private individuals and foundations coming up with large shares of it that then become partners with the government to reduce the government's risk, but take advantage of the agility of a private foundation and the risk, you know, tolerance that they might have compared to a government panel where we literally will have, you know, 30 people reviewing it for, for 10 or 15 years, and rightfully so. But I guess the main thing that scientists could do is share their, you know, the one place that we, you know, we differ maybe is that I, I believe that we actually should require some amount of training, outreach, um, you know, how to communicate with the public, both for the benefit of the public who will learn more about science, but for science itself. Because if science cloisters themselves, we cloister ourselves in our ivory towers, uh, doing special things with specialized people and specialized tools, the public, you guys are gonna lose interest and say, what the hell? I mean, if I work, I used to work in a, in a kitchen in a, um, in a American restaurant, you know, style restaurant in New York State, and if my boss came in, he said, what are you doing? I said, listen, boss, you can't understand what I'm doing. What I'm doing is so specialized, so intense, so intelligent. They would say, F you, you're out of here. We don't need you anymore, you're arrogant. And I think science as a whole does this, and the excuse is always, I'm not good at it. Well, I'm sorry, Lawrence, but you weren't born knowing quantum electrodynamics. You had to learn that from your teacher Feynman and from other people. You put effort into things that you deem worthy and valuable. And I think we need to teach students at a young age. There are college students and high school students here. Make a YouTube video. Do something. It'll redound to your benefit in ways your future self will thank you, public will thank you, science will thank you. Well, you know, I don't disagree with you in the way you think because um, – I don't think they should be required, but I think what we need to do is include communication in the training of scientists more, and it's and and for many reasons. Not least, first of all, most students who are taking classes in science aren't going to become scientists. But you know, I spent a lot of time when I had Case, which is largely an engineering school, talking to engineers, and the engineers who succeeded are the ones who could communicate best in their company. And so I was once many years ago, MIT asked me to be on an advisory board. Uh, and interestingly enough, the idea was to include writing in the science courses because at MIT, they all had to take a writing class, but it was from some writing instructor that none of them had any, any respect for. But if the professors that they had respect for required them to write in the class, then they'd spend time doing it. And, and I think you're right. It's a, a skill that's important for anyone. And it's, it, if, if we train more students to do it. In fact, when I was a graduate student, I never once, I was amazed. I, I, all the time I was a graduate student doing my PhD at MIT, never once was asked to give a, a, a presentation. I, the first one I gave was after I got the job at Harvard and I was down at Princeton. It was really, it was really amazing to me. So I think it would be a, a, a good thing. But, but regarding the cost, I, I do want to take a little time because they don't cost much. That's the point. A hundred million dollars is in, in in the scheme of things is not much. Even ten billion dollars, the Large Hadron Collider or the Hubble Space Telescope, spent over twenty years, is less than the cost of a of a sophisticated. Well, certainly much less than the cost of an aircraft carrier. It's like the cost, the Xerox costs of the Defense Department maybe are ten times as big, and so um, so it's really not much. And 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 therefore you have to ask yourself: Are we so poor as a society? that we can't do that. And my favorite line of this was, comes from Robert Wilson, who was the first director of the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory. And when it was being built, he, he testified for Congress, and they asked him if it would aid in the defense of the nation. And he said, no, but it'll help keep the nation worth defending. And I think that's really important, because if we are so poor that we can't, we have to stop asking questions about the universe, which is one of the driving things that keeps humans human, then we might as well just give up. Anyway, okay. Mario asks, for both gentlemen, what is your opinion on how the government is handling the UFO situation? Do you believe the videos are solid proof? Um, I'll start. You can... Um, um, no, videos are not solid proof. I can give you videos. Uh, I've been... You know, I, every movie is not... Watch a good movie and you'll see you're being tricked. It's you got to watch out about being tricked. Okay? And magic I like because it's honest lying because I'm telling you I'm tricking you. But, so videos, 
And eyewitness evidence is the worst kind of evidence. Unfortunately, they use it in court cases, but it's, it's not good evidence, and you have to be skeptical. So that there's been no, there's not a single piece of evidence, not one piece of evidence, I repeat that, there's not a single piece of evidence that anything that we haven't, we don't know what we see, and there are lots of things we don't know what we see, there's not a single piece of evidence that the scientific community would say is solid of, of anything related to aliens, okay? And, and that's, no matter what people say, there's no evidence about that. As far as the government's handling it, I actually think they're not doing as bad a job now. They're trying to be more open. Um, and I, I watched the press conference from the NASA uh, committee that talked about it. And, and, and you know, they, I think they buried the lead, as we, used, we say in the newspaper business, because it was late in the thing where they said there's no evidence of aliens. They, there was a long preamble and most people didn't get it. But, you know, the, the idea is to try and be open about it. But the notion to me, to me, the most unrealistic thing about aliens and UFOs is the idea that our government could have this incredible conspiracy of secrecy for 60 years. I mean, come on. Nothing can be secret. And just think about it. If one person who had knowledge about this could make a gazillion dollars if they could speak about it, you know when that's the case, there's no way that's going to remain secret. So to me, the most unrealistic thing about all of this UFO conspiracy is that the government can keep secrets. Yeah, I mean, I would only add that, you know, the two of us up here and the other scientists that are here tonight <clears throat> are represent incredibly conflicted people in that there's no one more than us, than we scientists. Who would love nothing more than to discover the existence of an advanced civilization and master the laws of time travel, physics, and interplanetary wormholes, correlation, whatever, and able to, to do these feats of technology simply because of the venal reason that we would get to have thousands of Nobel Prizes and we would get to skip ahead in our understanding of science by many centuries. And so I kind of get a little bit annoyed when my, my friends in the UFO pro community say things like, oh, you're just covering up, or you have a vested interest in us not being correct. And, and, uh, and big astronomy, and I love it if big astronomy could control anything, uh, even, even, you know, uh, for, for self-interested reasons. So anyway, we have a vested interest, and we are saying we haven't seen this. We would like nothing more than it to be true. But as Lawrence's friend Carl Sagan used to say, you need to keep an open mind, but not so open that your brains fall out. And you have to hold them to the same standards, uh, our friends in the UFO community, just because you can, you know, see things that you, uh, you know, eyewitness reports, like Lauren said, it's really not uh, rising to the level of data anal analysis, et cetera. So I, I, I largely agree. But just to add, I would love it to be true. I want to have evidence. I, I say I don't want to believe as Mueller or Skull. Fuck Smoldar said, we want to believe. We all do want to, yeah, well, and the problem is most of us do want to believe, and that what scientists have to remind themselves is that they want to believe in their own experiments, in their own theories, and the, what, what science is good at, at telling us is that recognize that you want to believe, and as Feynman said, the easiest person to, to, to fool is yourself, because you know what you want your theory to be right, you want your observation to be right, you constantly have to second-guess yourself, and that's really a, something that's a, a lesson from science that, that, that we really, you know, can be so important. One last thing. So there are people in science even, I've interviewed them. Uh, Steve Coonan was on my podcast. So Lawrence has written a book. Steve Coonan wrote kind of an opposition book that, you know, unsettled science. Um, I just want to say that uh, all of us agree, even if you're a climate change skeptic, that reducing CO2 and the cometon pollutants will redound to the benefit of human health. I don't think anybody, even the most ardent, you know, per opponent of climate change regulation or, or technology will argue against that. But uh, just the same way with UFO technology and the supposed technology, I think it could also benefit humanity by making aerospace safer, by, uh, by uh, having better communication, freedom of information, and transparency with the government. I think that's always a good thing. So I think no matter what, it's a net good. But, but again, let's keep, our, let's keep scientifically approaching it, and I think that will eventually redound to the benefit of everybody. I won't, because of time, I won't, but if you... Uh, Carl Sagan's last book, A Candle, Science is a Candle in the Dark, is a masterpiece. And, and it's wonderful to re have him read him talk about UFOs because he points out what a cultural phenomenon it is. People used to see the same things 100 years ago and call them fairies. I mean, it's a property of the culture at the time. And so 
Why were UFOs being seen 500 years ago? Because they were attributed to something else. So each culture of its time has their own version of UFOs. And, you know, just like the fact that most people who believe in God happen to believe the God that their parents believe in makes you, should make you suspicious. It should all, you should also be suspicious of the fact that, that these things are a property of time. And I'm not, I wanted the last question because I want you to get home to your kids. And it's a simple question. What's your favorite thing or topic to talk or BS about? Doesn't have to be science related. And why is it so fascinating or enjoyable to you? Uh, well, living here in San Diego, uh, it, the thing that I turn to for relaxation are the San Diego Padres. And I always say the easiest job in the world is to be a meteorologist here in San Diego. This is typical weather for us. And the hardest job is to be a sports chemist because we've never won a single championship. So for me, it's, uh, it's relaxation is that. I, and I, I get a lot of enjoyment sitting on the couch with my kids and my wife and just watching the Padres lose. Well, I, I, the rest of us enjoy watching the Padres lose too. But, but um, uh, uh, I think for me, I would say it's movie. I like to, well, I think we like, I like to, or, you know, things I see. And I don't really watch TV, so for it's movies or documentaries, but BSing about movies I like. And I, I, I make some movies too. And so I, I've always been fascinated by movies and, and I, because they also inspire the imagination. And in fact, as, as, as Stephen Hawking wrote in, in the foreword of The Physics of Star Trek, science fiction helps inspire imagination. And so anything that helps inspire imagination excites me. And I get the same excitement for movies as science because they both, uh, they both tickle my mind. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. This podcast is produced by the Origins Project Foundation, a nonprofit organization whose goal is to enrich your perspective of your place in the cosmos by providing access to the people who are driving the future of society in the 21st century and to the ideas that are changing our understanding of ourselves and our world. To learn more, please visit originsprojectfoundation.org.